Good morning, everyone. Uh, Friday the 13th, 2023. Welcome to our Friday SLO talk. Uh, as always, uh, I am joined by the coaches group. My name is Jarek Janjo. I'm the founder of the Friday SLO talks. And here's the coaches who are here to help us moderate the discussion. Uh, Enrique, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Enrique Howardy. I'm the SLO coordinator uh, from uh, Fresno City College in the Central Valley. Uh, along with all my other peers, uh, would you like to introduce yourself, coaches? Yes, I am Amanda Tainter. I'm the faculty coordinator of instructional design and outcomes at Reedley College, a sister school to Enrique's Fresno City College. Welcome, everybody. Michelle. Hi, I'm Michelle Dunbar. I work in assessment in academic affairs at California State University, Dominguez Hills. Glad to be here with y'all. Benny. Uh, hi, everyone. Good morning. My name is Danny Pittaway. I'm a full-time faculty member at Coastline College, and I'm the SLO coordinator and also the student success coordinator. And welcome, everyone. At this time, uh, please use the chat to introduce yourself. Tell us where you're from, how's the weather, and all the good stuff. Uh, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Jadik. All right. Well, thank you very much, coaches, for joining us. Thank you very much. We have a couple of presenters today. Uh, the others have to had to reschedule the, the the session for later day. So we have uh, Frederick uh, Burak starting us off uh, from from Kansas State. The topic of our discussion is um, Canvas and artificial intelligence. As, as we were getting ready for this uh, talk today, we really found it well. Let's just say challenging to to um, accommodate the two sides of the spectrum. We had uh, people who know Canvas very well, but 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 are still not very well versed with the, the uh, combination of uh, Canvas with artificial intelligence tools. And then we have um, AI experts, but we don't have, but who, who may not have the expertise with, with Canvas. So uh, hopefully between the two presenters that we have today, uh, we will have a great discussion. We have a fantastic mix. Um, it is a talk as always, so please don't hesitate to put your comments, questions in the chat. We are going to have a Padlet running as well in the background. So if you have any questions, there, there's a number of questions already there. You can post them there. You can uh, attempt to answer them as well. There's there's nothing wrong with that. Let's, uh, let's have a discussion. And uh, we already uh, spoke with Fred. He's okay with, with, with being interrupted. Just, just, just give him a uh, 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 some 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 time to finish the, the the thought whatever he's talking about but he he's ready to answer all the questions as they come in so here we are uh, Frederick Barak welcome thank you very much for joining us well I'm really glad to be here and I'm excited about this topic we have a, a canvas and and AI and different things what I've been asked to do is First, initial, initially, talk a little bit about Canvas. What is that architecture of Canvas, the assessment component of Canvas? A lot of us know a lot about a Canvas and because we use it in our classes and we have assessments in our classes. But when I'm talking about the assessment architecture, I'm not at all talking about what fa the place where faculty are using assessment in their classes. I'm talking about another component which is built in the canvas. Everyone has access. It's not something you buy. Most people don't know what's there or how to use it. I want to share the real powerful power of the technology of canvas. And also, what do you do with that data that it comes out of canvas? How do you use that effectively? Then I want to tie that into AI. What is how can we use Canvas data, student learning data, the achievement scoring that we have, that we collect through Canvas and be able to use AI to be able to communicate and understand that data a little bit more. So let's talk a little bit first about the Canvas architecture. And as I as mentioned before, I very much do want you to share any questions that you have. I had the uh, chat window up to, to follow along with chat, but. In the meantime, I somewhat lost it. So I'm going to let them follow the questions and interrupt me if there's some questions in chat, or you can interrupt as you go, because when those topics come up, you have a question about, you know, how do you, how do you use this or what some advantages you have to this type of thing? Certainly ask them right away while we think about it. Frederick, I don't yeah. want to um, jump the gun, but I'm, I'm assuming you'll define what assessment architecture is. 
That's exactly oh, what I'm going oh, right. to do right now. Just make it. Yeah, sure. keep, yeah, interrupt me anytime you want to. Canvas is built upon a particular architecture, which means that what the faculty normally see is this course level. This is the place where you put all the assignments, you communicate with students, you put the grade book in, you have all the different aspects with inside of a class. Now, this is where the scoring takes place. But when we're looking at data collection, that needs to go beyond the course. We look at program achievement data, which are is data comes from multiple courses. That data needs to be collected outside of the course. What people don't realize is that in the architecture, in the background of Canvas, we call that the administrative level. There are multiple levels in which we can, this architecture, which we build the assessment component. First, above the course level, once it's in that administrative level, and by the way, I want to preface it with this, is we give each of the um, representatives from programs access to their administrative level to be able to create this architecture of assessments. In the program level, when we, we create the outcomes on the program level, they can be pulled down into the courses and used to collect data that is going to be used on the program level and aggregated across all the multiple courses that are assigned to that particular program. Above that, there's another level in the architecture, which is the college level, and a college then includes multiple programs. The reason it's important to recognize the architecture with, which is built with inside a canvas, one is to be able to connect things together so that a college can look across their programs and identify the learning that's happening within particular categories. It's also the architecture makes it available and easier for faculty to be able to find the particular outcomes that they want or need to assess in their courses that are specifically focused around a, a program or a college or the level that's above that, which is the entire institution level. Now, within this, uh, this is say you have institutional outcomes or general education outcomes that include courses that are in all the colleges across the program or across the entire uh, institution. Now, if you build an outcome on the course level, that's where the data lives. And in order to have access to that student achievement data, you have to go back to faculty and ask them to export that data and give it to you to be able to aggregate it together. The value of this architecture is that we can connect to those achievement levels in the courses without having them to go back and ask the faculty to do more work. That's the thing that they don't like about assessment is they're already grading in their courses. They're scoring their outcomes, they're identifying all the achievement aspects. And then we as assessment coordinators have to go back and ask them to do their work again or collect the data, put it together and organize it outside of the in uh, this uh, the, the particular uh, course uh, achievement where the data lives. If we can be able to connect it together and automatically pull those components of scoring that the faculty are already doing in their courses and aggregate it on the program level or the college level, that's this is exactly what we're doing manually. That saves so much time. I'll explain this a little bit more. Now, if uh, outcomes are created on the program level, uh, say a program um, in uh, ed elementary education has particular expectations that everyone in their, all the students in their program, no matter where it is in their program, that they have to achieve that uh, across their program through experiences, through assignments. If those program outcomes are built on the program level, they are pulled into the course and used in their everyday scoring, connected to uh, a scoring device, say as uh, a rubric that's used or possibly connected to multiple choice exams and specific questions applied to an outcome. They can be connected in that way. And our university builds all of our program outcomes in the administrative level, not in courses but on the program level that the faculty bring it down and connect into their courses. On the college level, some 
I used education before. Uh, in the College of Education, there are multiple programs, elementary ed, math ed, science, education, et cetera, but they are all have to be fit within a licensure program, which those licensure program requires the same outcomes across all of the different constituent parts of the uh, uh, within the College of Education. So they create all of their outcomes on the college level. So all of the programs that are within it can access those and connect those into their assignments and collect the automated collecting of that student achievement data. And as I mentioned before, uh, on the institution level, the general education outcomes, which includes all of the courses, we use it for uh, uh, first year experiences. And they're the courses go across the entire college in which they're all assessing these institutional first year experience outcomes. We create the outcomes on the institution level and then they connect to the activities that they have in their courses. Here's the advantage now of knowing and use of this architecture that when the faculty are scoring their assignments within their course or experiences, those scores that they have, of course, go to the faculty for their course grade. But the, at the very same time, when the faculty are scoring these outcomes for their course grade, they also automatically go to the level in which that outcome was created. In other words, it creates an automaticity of automatically collecting the information that's needed and not having to go back to faculty and ask them to pull scores and give them to you, and then you having to or organize them on a, a particular level. So it creates an automation of data collection. Hey, so quick think, question. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry to interrupt you. Uh, so when you're talking about the automation and the uh, architecture, how does Canvas know that courses to programs and programs go to, I mean, how are they, you have to set it up? Does Canvas know how to set it up? Who sets it up? When an institution brings in Canvas, it's connected to the, the, the structure which is built inside of the institution. The institution already knows this is the college. These are the uh, these are the programs in the college. Here are the courses that are assigned to this program. So that is already built. So that is already integrated or pulled into Canvas from the college side. So a couple of questions might be: Is how is your university integrating the Canvas? Yes, I was going to ask you that question. Yeah, that's exactly right. Most universities automatically have it integrated in there because they have that's how they organize their grade books and being able to uh, have communication and connect the right students to the right courses. And that's done inside the institution. What we don't know is this is what the institutions are already doing. It already exists for the most part in most colleges structures of Canvas. So now we use that structure that the institution has through the connection that Instructure or Canvas has already integrated. And then we're able to collect student achievement data directly from the source where students are demonstrating their achievement according to those particular outcomes. Did I answer your question, Kurt? Yes, so is it basically on the course ID, it's based on the the institution chose of how they want to operate the the auto i mean the data collection yes that's exactly right so the institution has a course id uh that course id is the, is recreated each term so that they know which term that course was have it's connected to a faculty and it's connected to a college and here's another thing that we don't quite realize inside of canvas canvas also creates its own id for the course for the program, for the outcome, each there's an internal ID automatically created by Canvas. So there is so much metadata that's available for us to be able to sort and organize later. And this organization is really the key to the automaticity. So I'm gonna jump to that next thing. That's a, a good segue. Once we understand the architecture, how do we, connect this to an automated process to be able to collect student achievement data directly from the source. If we look at uh, 
how the court, a faculty would normally look at. In our course, any particular course, they have particular course outcomes. And those course outcomes generally are combinations of multiple indicators. For example, you have a course outcome that they want need to learn the uh, internal mechanisms of the circulatory system. And that circulatory system includes multiple aspects, the heart, the, the, uh, the vein systems, the et cetera, et cetera, each of those different components. That's already the way we think as faculty. We create our, our, our particular course outcomes and our assessments built around those within our assessment structure of programs, we have learning outcomes expected of an entire program, say in biology, as you receive uh, a degree in biology, here's the expectations for learning and the skills that are developed. Those course outcomes somehow, that's part of the uh, alignment of curriculum, fit into those program learning outcomes that uh, that are expected for the degree process. What Canvas is able to do then is connect those specific course outcomes and the criteria to the institution outcomes. So when the faculty score their students, the selected criteria that fits within the program learning outcomes automatically flows into that bucket from the course outcomes into the program outcomes, and then can be reviewed not only within a course, but that same data can be reviewed across the program at the different places where those indicators are scored, and then come to an understanding of how students are achieving within the learning outcomes of the program from the data that comes from the course experiences, field experiences, uh, the different mechanisms in which students demonstrate their learning of those particular course outcomes from the root source, from the uh, curricular structure which is built. Now, a key thing to think about now with Canvas, Canvas needs to be considered as a data collection mechanism, not as an analytical system. Now, we know that on the course level, you can analyze item analysis on a particular ass assignment, but that only goes so far. It doesn't give us the looking at of achievement across an entire program. So if we look at Canvas as a mechanism of a structure to be able to collect student achievement data in an organized system of course outcomes criteria that fit into the program learning outcomes, the question is now, what do we do with that? How do we, if we can pull that data automatically from its source? This is, we would go outside a canvas and we can, in using any type of visualization program, we happen to use Power BI. Uh, others, you can use it right inside of Excel or uh, there are many different visual, visualization programs, but the faculty score their, their students within their courses or within these experiences using scoring devices, which are already used with inside a Canvas. And if we can pull them into some type of visualization and aggregate that within a program, we're able to give that information back to the program where they can use student achievement data to be able to make decisions. This, I'm gonna show you some examples of that we do here at our university and how Canvas fits so nicely into this organization. Uh, let's imagine now we had, there are five different bucket categories, which in the assessment world, we call outcomes. We call, often call written communication as an outcome. In reality, written communication is a, com is a bucket full of different indicators that make written communication, which is um, maybe use of citations and uh, appropriate uh, sentence structure and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. We, so the value of assessment is not only to look at those buckets of outcomes, but to get information on all those specific component parts that make up that outcome. In Canvas, when we look at all those indicators that are scored inside of a course in a particular rubric or any type of scoring mechanism, those are the individual component parts that are useful to understand the data. In Canvas, the outcomes are called groups. 
which we call outcomes. This is the important thing to think about when you understand about Canvas. We think about outcomes as these larger groups that has indicators in the middle. In Canvas, what they call outcomes are the specific accessible component parts. And that's the value of an assessment process to look down into the buckets of written communication or critical thinking and look at the component parts that are scored. And this is where we can be able to look, say, within critical thinking, you might have an overall score for critical thinking, but it was really important to understand that students are really having uh, trouble in one specific content area or an indicator or accessible uh, criteria, whichever word you want to use, that's semantics. But to look at the specific component parts where students are having trouble is where the faculty will get engaged with this data and be able to have it useful within their own instruction. So that's a general construct of how Canvas can be used to be able to look deeply. I'm gonna show you now specifically from an actual course, uh, um, what the students would look at or the faculty Frederick, would look at. Yes, right, there, uh, there's been a couple of questions and if this is better kind of at the end, but some questions about the logistics of the mapping, like from that uh, institutional ILO down through it, um, hearkening back to the graphic that you showed that assessment structure. So if it's better to edit the end, but there are some questions about just the logistics of the mapping from that ILO down to the course level. And the answer to that question is there are many different ways in which Canvas can be used within this creating this mapping. But if we think about, uh, say, an institutional learning outcome, recognizing that on the institution level, that is viewed and understood in many different ways. I'm going to look at, say, written communication. Written communication is a category which is understood in elementary education at a in a particular way. In other words, for a, for a student to demonstrate upon graduation effective written communication, their assessment structure and the expectations will look very different than someone in computer engineering who needs to be able to write in technical language and be able to put it in a, a totally different structure. Now, if we took the effect of written communication in computer engineering and gave that into English literature, it would fail miserably. But if we took the, the uh, ways that you would have to in, in say, um, English literature, and we had we demonstrated that in computer engineering, that would not be appropriate. So we look at the if we look at the mapping now in Canvas, we can have programs identify what are the ways, what are the specific expectations in their program to be able to write effectively or communicate effectively in a written form and in oral format, et cetera. Each of those programs can be able to collect information directly related to their particular program expectation. And in using a similar scale across that can be able to aggregate that together to know how the entire institution is within written communication with the caveat that each program is addressing this in the way that's appropriate for that discipline. That is one possibility of mapping the outcomes that come from courses into an institution level. There's another way of looking at it that we maybe want to look at the institution level at a particular space, like at the end of general education before they get into their disciplinary level. And we want everyone to demonstrate the same competencies, which would be a whole different structure of mapping. But all of those are available within using Canvas architecture in a variety of ways. Did, did that get a little closer to what you're probably asking for, Amanda? Um, I'll let uh, the question askers in the chat clarify if they need any more depth to it, yes. Pedro, if I can piggyback on uh, um, Amanda's also. There was a question on the chat uh, regarding, uh, as we set up assignments in Canvas, should we be attaching them to a specific SLO? Otherwise, how do we collect the data? If 
Uh, that yes, the answer is yes. And let me give a caveat to that so you understand what that yes means. I'll use give an example from our university that might help understand that uh, each program at our university have defined what the learning expectations of their degree program. And those expectations are placed in the canvas on the administrative level with outcomes, outcome folders, which they call groups. And inside of those folders are the specific things that they assess within that group. Now, then if they are already created on that administrative level, then a faculty in that course can go find the outcome, bring it down into their course and connect it to any one of their scoring devices that they would like to connect it with. So in other words, it's not when we collect in what Canvas does, it doesn't collect assignment scores or grade point averages. It, con it connects of whatever outcomes have been pulled into it, it gets the score of that specific outcome. So let's imagine there's a rubric for an assignment that you have five scoring lines, and this one happens to be an outcome that you pulled from the program. When that score for this rubric line goes back to the program where all five of them go toward the, the, the grade of the assignment. And there are multiple ways to do that. So the answer is yes. In order to collect information for an outcome, first, the outcome has to exist. Second thing, that outcome has to be connected, is pulled into the course and connected to an assignment. But at that point on, once it's connected, all the, when the faculty scores, the scores go to where they need to go. And whenever that course is copied over to use again, that automatically keeps going. So once the structure is built inside a canvas, it becomes an automatic process of being able, the programs being able to see the data that they have decided that they need to look at in a particular way, which is now a great segue, uh, segue into what I wanna show you now is what does it look like? If you pull Canvas data that's organized within a structure, what can it look like? This comes from music education and they're accredited. They have an accreditation and licensure program. Their licensure requires seven different categories of learning. The eighth one is the institutional outcomes, but they have seven different categories that are assessed across multiple courses. So this is automatically pulled out of the scoring devices that are used within assignments across their program. And say pedagogical skills, maybe it goes across four or five different courses and multiple assignments in those courses. It just pulls the scoring line that was attached into their rubric and pulls it together according to those specific components. So in other words, they can look at their student achievement data by categorical skills. And if we look directly inside of pedagogical skills, we see that it's made up of five different component scored components, the scored indicators, which made up that one line, which is pedagogical skills. So now that I can see their students' achievement as according to what has been scored within particular assignments. They also might look to see where does this, that assignment come? So then they can look to see that what assignment that particular scoring line comes from. It gives them an opportunity to be able to look deeply across their curriculum. Something that's not, well, it's, it's very difficult to do if you're looking at course grades and assignment grades. It's almost not possible to do. But Canvas architecture, collecting the data in this way, makes this type of visualization possible. We connect all this information to the student, the student information system so it knows their gender, their first generation, ethnicity, et cetera. So if they would like to analyze their data even deeper, let's say uh, um, if I collect, click here on the transfer students, now we're seeing all the scores from just the students who are transferred. And we can see the comparison of those who were transfer students compared to non-transfer students. 
that the transfers into the program are doing very well in num as well as everyone else in that area number six, but they're having more trouble in the outcome two and four, as we see in this particular point. This is the value of the architecture built in Canvas is where now we can dig down to the specific component assessed criteria. And when we combine that together with different other data sources, we, it can expose challenges that students are having within particular, uh, particular courses or particular um, outcome areas, and then to be able to use that for discussion. Now, if we wanna connect this on what, how can this data be used with AI? What, um, what we started doing this year is adding to their tables that we have visualized is an opportunity for the faculty when they're analyzing this data to it automatically keep track of that data. So if they, uh, what we started with this year, instead of having a separate report that once a year, they have to look at their data and give it to the Office of Assessment, which separates it a little bit away from the data, we're giving them an opportunity to, when they look at the data, whenever it's relevant, to click on the input comments and it brings up a window of, uh, another window off to the side so they can see their achievement data. And they also can see, uh, have this feedback data where they would select the outcome that they want to give feedback and type in, this is the feedback. This is what we learned from it. Here's the, uh, the set of scores. In other words, this is their, their report that they have on the on the data for each of those component parts. This uh, so if the if they had report on the, the say the semester prior, their former report will come up, and then they will see what they talked about later in the past time, the goals that they had, and then they would re change this, retype over it, and it doesn't replace their old their old report. It it updates it, so we have a continual running. Uh, time-stamped collection of their self-review of their, of their particular outcomes for each of the outcomes. I'm gonna get back to why this is important for AI, but just keep that in mind of this possibility because this is where AI can come in very valuable later. So if we think of AI integration, uh, this is, we're just starting in this. I'm really excited for the next presentation because I'm going to learn a lot of things from the next presenter. But this is what we've started putting in with AI is having AI look at all of this groups of data and identifying according to these different uh, parameters, uh, the, the descriptive, descriptive aspects of their cohort to, to have AI analyze what, what aspect of the student is in this particular is, in, is the increase that causes an increase of scores. So we, we can see in this, or the faculty are then able to see according to uh, the, all the data that's submitted, those who are non-transfer students are performing at a certain percentage at a higher rate or a higher quality than those who are, who are transfer students that first generation, who are not first generation students are a, a slightly higher, et cetera. Where, and then when they want to dig down a little bit deeper into this data, they can look that in the highest factor, there are the non-gen males who are non, if we this is set to low now, those who are having the lower scores, the greatest factor that is being influenced, that is influencing a low score within correlation is the first generation, those who are not first generation students. And are, and are male are the two factors that we might want to look at. So the next uh, one, which is not quite as strong, is the females that are non-white are having lower scores than the other factors, et cetera. So that get this integration of AI have, has given a possibility for faculty and programs to look more deeply at who are their students which are the students that are finding greater success? Which are the students that are having a little bit of challenges? One thing we want to add to this, which I think AI is going to be possible to do, and Zola, I hope you can answer this question when you get to your thing, is being able to have, have it identify not only these factors, uh, but be able to uh, maybe by including some type of R analysis to say, is this difference 
really significant so that it isn't just looking at data, not really understanding what it's all about, but uh, to to bring out and bring put right in the, uh, into the face of the people reviewing this data. Here's something which over time, it looks like here's a factor that needs to be looked at. Uh, we're not quite sure exactly how to build AI yet to be able to create that form of analysis that's going to give our faculty and our programs indicators of what direction to go into their thinking. Uh, but what we're looking for is this comes from um, a product that we're going to start putting into our aspect is looking at these multiple data sources across time and then having AI come up with its analysis of the data, whatever we're putting in there, and be able to create the summary of the data that's being used uh, that are, we're trying to compare together and have it summarize, have, have it provide a, a guide for the faculty and program to make to decide whether they want to move in a particular direction. Here's what we have started adding is where the faculty members then or the programs can decide which outcomes they want to look at and they can select here at this panel up on top and they can see students scores over time in relation to that, that specific outcome category. And right now we have it creating the summary that's underneath, that's AI created. So in other words, we ship to a different, um, different set of outcome scores, it will revise this summary. Right now it's very simple, but gradually I think we're gonna be able to build that up into identifying uh, bringing to the attention of the program directors and the faculty things that they might want to look at. So some future directions that we're planning. Let's go back to the narrative analysis now. If we have maintained a continual sequence, timestamp sequence of the analysis that faculty have made of their data and goals or uh, uh, interventions that they wanted to place as a result of that data, I think we are gonna be able to use AI to summarize these changes in the way the faculty are responding to the data and possibly creating some type of developmental timeline for how the students are, or students, I'm sorry, how the programs and how the faculty are thinking about data, ideas and improvements that they have initiated. It probably can come up with a bulleted list uh, um, say in this year, we, we addressed this outcome and this year we, we added this type of thing. So in other words, being able to put together, uh, have it create an analysis of the analysis that faculty have made of the achievement data. That's one of the directions we're gonna try to build in with AI. Another aspect is to look at the longitudinally students achievement data, looking at the challenges and the success and try to expose different correlations. In other words, to combine into that the sequence of content and to see if the sequence of content that a program is using might, might actually be contributing to the challenges students are having that maybe uh, suggesting altering the sequence would help students' achievement or maybe in the course sequence or looking at demographic cohorts across time uh, to be able to see what other factors might be involving in students, involved in students' challenges that they're experiencing in achievement. Another uh, direction we're looking at AI is to bring to the faculty's attention the learning challenges that have happened over time, and then be able to anticipate if we make these interventions or alter it, having AI look forward as to say, uh, Here's some changes that might improve achievement. Having uh, AI look at all the data together and make look at the trends of learning challenges or even the success of past interventions. In other words, uh, looking at the interventions or uh, curricular changes that a program has made and then look at student achievement that's related to that to see if that program intervention or the change in curriculum has actually made a difference in achievement to have it analyze that data. So those are some ideas that we're looking at that AI might have some impact. So uh, I'm curious to see of your, uh, your, your feedback towards some of the things that we're doing, if you have any questions on how we're 
putting this all together. Uh, this is a great time to, to discuss some of your questions. Thank you, Frederick, uh, for your uh, wonderful presentation. There's multiple questions that we have in the chat going on. And uh, the other, uh, as local coordinators, feel free to uh, uh, butt in here. Uh, one is, um, how this, did the your institution create uh, any specific un uh, alignment on campus uh, through a third party? Was it? integrated into into campus was it a discussion among your institution how you want how you wanted the campus to be set up yeah that's a is a good point with that when we started with canvas was in 2014 that's when canvas first initiated their assessment components and a lot has been developed since when our canvas in our the people on canvas on campus started integrating Canvas and starting using it in the courses, I went, I snuck into some of those meetings to hear what they were doing. And their idea was, well, let's first teach people how to use Canvas in their courses, develop their course content. And later on, we'll start adding this assessment component on top of that. That's when I stood up and says, no, we can't do that. And there's, you know, they, they, and I explained why it says the whole thing is if, if the campus starts using Canvas and people create all the courses, they create all their assignments, and they haven't connected it to outcomes, then when we want to add outcomes after that, they're going to have to do all their work over again. We need to create the outcomes first, which we already had outcomes, uh, all the programs. We need to have them already in Canvas before we teach them how to use Canvas so that we teach them to connect them into their courses right away because we don't want to have faculty to have to do things twice. My goal is to simplify the process of assessment, not to make it more complicated. So what we did is uh, our IT people said that, well, we don't have time and we don't understand assessment well enough to do it. So I says, let me do it. Let me teach them how to use Canvas. So I had to learn how to use Canvas. And then at that point, we sim our Office of Assessment simply took over all of the coordination of how to build outcomes in the Canvas. And this is how we learned the, this, this architectural structure because Canvas doesn't tell you much about that. And th there are literally almost no instructional guidance from in structure from Canvas on how to use this administrative level. And that's the most powerful component of Canvas. As, as you see, you know, if we build, if we build outcomes on the course level, we can't get to that data because it lives in the courses. So I, it would have been forces us to go ask the faculty to do more work to give us the data. So if we build it on that administrative level, it saves the faculty so much time and it facilitates our data collection to the point where we can give faculty back all their data automatically. And what we have done is automatically three times a day, we pull all the outcomes data and the scoring data out of Canvas and put into our warehouse. It just happened, and now it happens automatically. From that, we have we do all our transformations in what we call a data flow. We transform it to get ready to go into tables. And then we have created a template that every that filters it down to that program. So uh, we the data automatically flows on a daily basis out of Canvas into these tables, which we give back to the faculty and their programs. They do all the analysis. We don't analyze their data at all, but they have access to all of these tables and graphs to look at their achievement data, to be able to uh, look at the difference between gender and between first generation, et cetera, and to use that to make decisions. With that process, over the last couple of years, we have several articles that are coming out right now. We've had programs who've been collecting data since 2017, and they looked at the data from before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and after the pandemic, not only by outcomes, but by individual criteria. And they have discovered which of the specific criteria students actually did better than the pandemic than before the pandemic. 
and at what happened after that pandemic into coming back into the into the face-to-face uh, -face teaching and discovered things that they did during the pandemic that actually improved student learning. So they adjusted their teaching instead of going back to what they did before, they kept what they were doing during the pandemic because it improved students' grades and other things that didn't work as well that they'd make adjustments and, and flow from that. Uh, so the, the two great impacts that using Canvas has done one is it got programs to look at what is their structure, their curriculum map? How does it all fit together? Where do the core, the courses and the content in the courses fit together within the program's expectations? If nothing else, it got the faculty to think about curriculum. And the changes that they made were even far greater than I possibly had expected because there's an ownership that there, it's their decisions, it's their structure. When after that, what's been amazing is how valuable the faculty and programs see at looking at their data. We have, I have faculty members who on a daily basis will say, I gave this test yesterday and I don't see it in my tables today. They have become so involved in assessment and the value of the data and seeing it this way that assessment is something that is a very positive and exciting thing among our programs, where it used to be something that they hated doing because we had forced, you know, we we're forcing them to redo things over and over and over, and we were the ones evaluating it. Canvas has made it possible through other visualization programs for them to take ownership of their data and their assessment process. Now, if we can add AI into this, that actually will help them to analyze their data and bring to their attention things that they don't normally see, that is the next, uh, the next step that I think we're at. I see this question that Caitlin just says, how long did it take us to set this up? It took us a long time because we started with nothing. And we started with Canvas before they had a lot of things developed that they have. But I would estimate if by understanding the architecture and, under, and having programs think through this process, we generally take a program who starts from the point of looking at their curricular structure, choosing their hierarchy of the outcome categories and the, the accessible indicators and connecting into their courses. That usually takes about a, a semester or two semesters to get that structure built in Canvas. Then we take a third semester to pilot just one or two outcomes to make sure everything works. One thing with Canvas, anything. Yes, I do have all these written steps. I see this, JD mentioned that. Uh, let me finish this and I'll, I'll answer your question, JD. Uh, that the third, the third semester is usually piloting to make sure all the technology works because there are always problems in technology. I will suggest do not try to develop this structure and do it across a whole program all at one time because you will run into some technology problems that you need to fix. And there's one thing that faculty don't like is bringing in a technology and it doesn't work right away. And if it doesn't work right away, you'll never get them back. So we start, I, I, I have programs saying, we wanna integrate this structure right now. We wanna do it with everyone. I, we won't allow them to do it. I says, don't even talk to your faculty about it yet until we know it works. Then we have something to show them so that there's an understanding. So I said a couple semesters to be able to really solidify and think about their, their, uh, their curriculum. Now, some programs have already done that. They can move right into the pilot, but we pilot these by connecting them to one or two courses and collect data and create a visualization like you saw on these tables. Once we have the visualization of actual student work, that's what grabs the faculty. And then we just gradually add courses until we get it. So it might be two years to finally get it integrated into a program. That's the I think that's about the quickest I would ever try to move forward. Uh, the question JD was asking, do we have a set of timeline instructions and step-by-steps? Um, yes, <laughs> on, on our uh, Office of Assessment website, you certainly can go there 
we've created a lot of videos of how to uh, how to go into Canvas and create the program outcomes, the course outcomes, how to pull them into courses, how to how to score them, how to then later put them into into tables and graphs. All that is a step by step. Uh, thing that uh, we have videos created, but I'm also happy to share with any of you any of these aspects. But Canvas is the secret, is that you only can visualize and analyze data that's been collected. Canvas is the data collection mechanism. It's not the analysis. It doesn't have those capabilities, but it is a powerful mechanism to be able to get to the source of what faculty are doing and collect the data so you can analyze it however you want to do it. Thank you, Enrique. Uh, Danny, you have a, you have your hand raised? Oh, thank you, Enrique. Yeah, I was just uh, monitoring the chat. I just wanted to bring a question forward. Um, I apologize, Frederick, if you may have already addressed this as I was trying to focus on the chat at a certain point, but there seems to be a question about what's involved in the back end of setting up this multi-tier alignment? In other words, how many folks are involved at your university in creating that and also sustaining it? There's a question about the automaticity of, of um, that system once it's put together with the dashboards and so forth. Okay, so we have two different components. One is the structure you talked about. When the structure is built into your Canvas and your university already has a structure built in and that just stays there. It doesn't change unless your program changes, that a program moves from one college to another, then we have, in essence, we have one person at the university who takes care of all that, that aspect. When we look at the building of the tables and graph stuff, we do that in our Office of Assessment. I have myself an assistant director that takes care of all of that. Now, here's the key is in we have every program has a person designed, at least one person who is their assessment coordinator. We give them administrative access to the place where outcomes are built. And then we show them how to do it. There's two reasons for that. It is not sustainable for our office to maintain all the different changes that happens across all the programs across the whole university. Uh, we can't keep up with that. We started doing it, but we, we can't keep up with it. That's when we went to giving them, this is, we coached them. Now you've got the coaches as your title. We coached them on how to use Canvas. So in other words, when their accreditation changes or their outcomes change, they make the changes themselves. At that point, all of that is automatic. When they make a change in Canvas, it's automatically pulled down into the warehouse on a daily basis. If they change their outcomes, their outcomes are changed in Canvas. It's, it's part of the mechanism. So the sustainability of uh, the system we have, all I do is every once in a while, data gets stuck somewhere. And I will go and find out where it gets gets stuck in the pull down or, or um, something needs to be refreshed. We have our refreshes automatic too. So in general, uh, what used to take hours, hours, weeks and months to collect information, analyze these reports that have been made across the uh, institution and give feedback back to the program, that becomes a nearly automatic process. It takes, uh, you know, 15, 20 minutes, what used to take months for us to do because of the automaticity. And the nice thing is the analysis of their student achievement data is something they do, not something I do. Why we create a system for them. I see Erica's hands up. Thank you, Frederick. Uh, we have one more question. Uh, anyone? Is there time for, for another, for this question, hopefully? Um, well, yes. Fred, if, you, if yes, there's Erica. not time for this, you can say no. Um, so I'm just curious um, when providing disaggregated data to, and sort of as you're saying that coaching faculty to use it, coaching program leadership to sort of engage with these data mindfully, how do or slash what do you do to um, train or coach faculty in equitable use of disaggregated data so that we're not reinforcing deficit narratives about student achievement uh, inadvertently through sort of relinquishing these dashboards? I am so glad you asked that, asked that because that is very, very important. 
we do not provide the data to people without training on how to use the data. So we, we sometimes have just group presentations to the institution, but I really don't believe in that because one program uses data differently and thinks differently than another program. So the way we do it is we, we have them analyze their data and they report back to us their findings of the data. And then we report back to them with feedback, written feedback, and we meet with every program curricular and we meet with every co-curricular program on our feedback back to them where they feed that back to their faculty, which comes back through them back to us. And it's a continual cycle on many programs. That's an annual cycle of feedback. Some programs we do it every term. It all depends on their uh, mechanism with now the inclusion of getting having them provide their, their analysis right inside of Power BI while they're looking at the data and they will put it right in there is we are going to create now a mechanism to identify or something that brings to our attention. This program has now reviewed their data. So we'll immediately give them feedback. So then it'll be just a continuous flow rather than we're going to collect the whole university all at the same time, all in one year, which makes our job. <laughs> yeah, I see your eyes in there. Yeah. That's what we've been doing for years. Yeah, and we try to do it all at one time. And now it becomes part of the way we do things. It's the way that they assess, it's the way their program works. It becomes an organic system assessment does in student learning. Did I answer your question? Yes, thank you. Frederick, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. Uh, we thank you. Uh, you know, um, at this time, I want to uh, ask Jarek to. Uh, uh, present our next presenter. No, I introduce her. I'm sorry, introduce our, our next presenter, Jarek. Take it All away. Right. Yes. Thank you so much. Uh, well, uh, let me just say that, uh, Frederick, with all the details that you have shared with us, I, I tell you, you have just exposed this complexity of the system, right? I, I tell you, each one of those those larger topics alignment the setup. I think that was a very important question there about how you make it work, right? Because again, you 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 made a very excellent point. Once you discourage people or there is something wrong at the beginning, forget it. You know, you, you're done. You may as well scratch and start doing something else. You're absolutely right. So each one of those topics is just calls for further discussion. So um at this point, Michelle, if, if you could please perhaps speak about your group so that, you know, because we have a lot of people here who yeah. could probably be interested in 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 in, in learning about this. We, we do have a support group on, on sure. campus and Michelle is leading it, please. Thanks, thanks. Yeah, can you, can you hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, yeah, we, we have, um we've really broken into two working groups. We, um if, learning communities, really, we're learning together and um, we meet twice, uh, well, each group meets once a month on Mondays. I think it's the second and fourth Mondays. Uh, one group focuses on the Canvas setup and working with faculty, getting the buy-in and all of that intricate work to implement and, and get folks bought into it. And the other group is focusing on uh, making sense of the data and building and using data dashboards. So, you know, some of our, um, we started out as just one one group, but it's really big. And we said, we really wanted folks to be able to get, get their hands dirty, work together on projects to figure things out, troubleshoot together. You know, everybody's at different stages at, of implementation. Some folks are really early on just learning to want to implement at their institution. Um, so it really runs the, the wide range and none of us are experts at all. <laughs> we might ask Fred to come <laughs> and help us a little bit perhaps, because uh, this was really helpful to hear. So if you're interested, I'll put my email in the chat if you want to be added to that list um, and then you'll get the invitations and all the materials letting you know what we're doing and you can come on by. And especially if you want to, like I said, get your hands dirty. It's really, it's not like, um, speakers and presentations. Sometimes there might be a demonstration if we find somebody and we might ask them to come and show us what they do, but mostly we're really trying to uh, to do it together as a learning community. So I will put my email in the chat for you and please uh, reach out to me if you're interested in getting added to that list. And one of our co-leads is here, Bernice, did you want to add anything to what I said or Bernice Hooley? Uh, no, I think uh, you really good commercial. Um, the only thing is our next meeting is coming up. Uh, for the can setting up Canvas out outcomes and working with faculty. Um, that meeting is 
the 23rd, 23rd of yeah. October, and we do have homework for it. So if you're interested in participating, let Michelle know prior to that so she can send you the homework assignment. Thank, Thank you. Bruce. Thanks, everyone. Michelle, I, I apologize. There's a question in the chat that I think a lot of people are sharing. We, we, we've we been kind of like caught off guard with this announcement. Would you just please say what kind of a group it is? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. It's it's, 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 <laughs> yes, <right>. yes. <laughs> uh, we call it the Canvas and SLO Assessment learning community basically, but we have two working groups that we've broken into because as you've seen a bit from this uh, wonderful presentation from Fred, it's very complicated and there's many layers to implementing, to getting faculty buy-in, to the data, you know, getting the data input, getting the data output, making the data actionable and via dashboards and other visualizations. So there's so many pieces that we broke into two working groups. The first of which is, uh, well, not, you know, first, but, um, Canvas setup and working with faculty and getting faculty buy-in. The next meeting for that, as Bernice just said, is October 23rd. Um, and there's some homework, some prep work for that, including watching some videos mostly to get ready um, for that discussion. Um, so if you were interested in that, be sure to text or not text me, <laughs> email me before, and, uh, before the 23rd. And the videos are actually former Friday slow talks. talks yes, segments exactly. of Friday slow talks. Yes. Uh, because so, we're building on, we really just came out of this uh, from an SLO talk, we started getting together. So yeah. Um, and then the second group focuses on um, making sense of the data and building and using and building dashboards. Um, and so, and then that one meets the, I think it's the fourth, fourth Monday of the month, but I'll send you all that. So is that enough of information to help? Um, just, just one, those, one more thing. Do yeah, those are not recorded. Oh, is that what you're going to ask? <laughs> no, no, no. The oh. question is about actually the, the, the membership, and there isn't really much of a membership to speak of, and anyone from outside of California can join. Oh, us. yeah. <laughs> yeah, we've got like, Bernice is at Tulane University. Several other folks are from yeah. you know, all over. Um, Nevada, yeah. we've got Virginia. So, yeah, every everywhere and anything is fine. And we've about, um, our list is like 52 people now. It really grew. We started with a group of five. We did an SLO talk last spring, and then similar to doing a demonstration, similar to um, some of the content that Fred was covering, although he had some great details that we didn't hadn't learned yet. Um, and then we got an explosion of interest. So that's why I wanted to let folks know here, if you're also interested in, you know, wherever, whatever stage you're at, if you want to kind of join a group that's also learning as we go uh, and learning together, that you can certainly, you're welcome to um, contact me. Excellent. Thank and, you. And we don't record, we record those if we have a demonstration, like a little, like we'll record that, but we really want people to feel like they can share freely, maybe their struggles and challenges. Um, and we don't want to really record that. You know, we want, we want it to just be um, a safe space, if you will, because it's a learning space. But if there's a demonstration or something, we record that, but otherwise we don't record those meetings. So I hope that covers all the questions. Yes. Yes. Michelle, please just remember, share your email address so that people can contact you. Thank you very much for, for sharing this. Indeed, great, great work. Thank you very much. Well, uh, next up, uh, Zola, please introduce yourself. The floor is yours. I don't want to be taking more from uh, away from your time. Thank you very much for joining us uh, this morning. Please. Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me. And uh, um, Fred, I'm sorry, I'm probably going to disappoint you a little bit because um, I don't have any of like the back end and, and canvas or administrative uh, tools in, in that sense. So I haven't had an opportunity to really play around with it. It's really more tailored to educators and what we can do to improve our learning spaces. So hopefully you'll still find some value out of my presentation, though. Um, but yeah, so my name is Zola Ponte. I have been in education or higher education for um, a little over a decade. I'm also a sociology instructor and instructional designer and a learning developer. And um, I, for the past year, have been working with Ashley Berry, and Ashley Berry and I will be back next week to talk about SLO and assessments and AI. So hopefully you'll tune in for that um, for that as well. But this this week or today, I will share with you um, a little bit about how I have been incorporating. Um, chat GPT specifically, and then some other AI tools as well into my learning environment and how it has really helped me kind of like fast track um, some pieces as far as like creating my canvas um, 
dashboard, creating my assignments, create implementing new um, uh, new quizzes and exams and discussions and that kind of stuff. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen. I'm gonna be jumping around a little bit because I'm actually going to do a little bit of show and tell. So I will be jumping around. Um, so I apologize if it feels like there's a lot that you need to follow, but um, just to start off, let me move some things. I also have two monitors, so you might see me looking looking in two different places. So um, the pieces that we are going to cover today is um, first, I'm going to talk a little bit about ChatGPT and then um, course building. So really how we can use ChatGPT for course building. So how should we tailor our prompts? Um, how can we use it to develop worksheets, discussions and assignments? And then we'll also be looking at prompting for different rubrics, formatting, and then implementing. And then I'll also show you hopefully a, a pretty cool way that you can also use ChatGPT to um, build quizzes to implement into Canvas. So um, the first thing, actually, let me just go through a little bit about ChatGPT. So um, I, unfortunately, am still on the free plan. So I'm going to just show you kind of what that looks like. Um, one moment here. So this is just ChatGPT's free plan. So they have two versions, which is the 3.5 and then the 4.0 section. And then the 4.0 is basically anything that's been included via the, the internet um, in the last, um, uh, since since after 2021. So it's recent data versus uh, 3.5, which is what I'm using is prior to 2021 and what most people have access to for free. So um, we want to just remember that when we are using ChatGPT, um, uh, hopefully most of you are, are relatively familiar with it because I'm not really going to do an overview today. I have another presentation that we've done kind of like an overview of what it is. So if you're interested in that and want to learn more about it on that end and like, you know, some of the biases that might come with, with um, ChatGPT and, and how to do prompting for other reasons, please feel free to reach out to me and I'll be excited to connect with you. But for today, um, what I'm going to do is basically share with you how to prompt for ChatGPT so that you can implement certain assignments and things like that into, uh, into your Canvas LMS. So I have my testing module up here so I can show you how that's gonna look like. And then I also have this um, prompting document that you will have access to. So I've already created all of my prompts and this is just to show you um, and like basically guide you through what I will be doing and then how we will be implementing this. Um, also, if you have any questions throughout, please feel free to just interrupt me, stop me. I don't mind having the conversation. So that's absolutely okay. Um, and then I will also go through, I, I just want to like, put out a little disclaimer here. So these are a lot of learning objectives and I'm using all of these learning objectives just so that you can kind of get an idea of like the quizzes implementation and things like that. Mostly as we are developing our lesson plans, we probably only use maybe one or two. So this is just, you know, a disclaimer for that just to kind of help you visualize. So, okay. So the first thing, like I said, is I want to start chatting about course building, right? So what we can do with ChatGPT is looking at lesson planning. So some of the things that we want to pay attention to is our ask, like what is it that we're asking of ChatGPT? So what is our role and what is our audience? What materials are we using? Um, maybe, you know, if it's via Canvas or computers or if we're in the classroom. We want to think about our learning objectives and then our needs. So what is it that we're actually asking for? What is the modality of the structure? So is it like what we're doing right now via Zoom? Is it a, you know, an online course? Are you teaching in person? And then we also want to um, think about some of the activities within our lesson plans and then some considerations. Okay. So the first thing that, sorry. The first thing that we're going to look at, okay, let me go through this. So this is my prompt, my original prompt, right? So I am asking ChatGPT 
to pretend that they are a sociology instructor. So what I'm gonna do first is I'm just gonna go ahead and copy this prompt while it is um, generating, because sometimes it takes a minute and then we will talk about it. So I'm using, so I'm talking about, again, my tools. So I'm using this book. Um, and then this week we're covering chapter eight, social stratification um, the United States and globally. And then, like I said, I have all my learning objectives here, right? So that's a lot. Um, usually we might just want to do one or two. And then the ask, so please help me create a lesson plan for adult learners and introduction to sociology. Use the learning objectives to create a lesson plan for a 75 minute session that will present it in person. So if you're doing this over Zoom, you can change that and then everything you know, that you are presenting will change. So please include an icebreaker activity, lecture components and a class interaction component. So. Now, um, ChatGPT has had a moment to look over my request. Um, I also wanna mention here that I've also said, uh, please use adult learning theories because those are different from pedagogy um, and then tailor it to multiple types of learners. And then the learners should be able to demonstrate their understanding through various levels of the Bloom's taxonomy framework by the end of the lesson. So those are things that I've included to ensure that it is, you know, it's covering my actual learning objectives. It's going over the things that I want to look at and then we can tailor it. So now ChatGPT Chat has helped me create this icebreaker. It even gives me, you know, um, or this lesson plan, I'm sorry. And then even gives me like how long for each component. And um, we can see- Zola, like said, I'm, yes, Zola, absolutely. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I just, no, I just wanted to, um, for, the, for the benefit of our audience who yeah. many, many in the audience are still becoming accustomed to ChatGPT and how to interact with it. I just- thought that what you were just talking about is so valuable. I wanted to ask if you could iterate it uh, again in terms of the, the multi-part ask, in terms of that is generated by the instructor. And I wonder if yeah. you could kind of elaborate on how careful we should be as instructors and how thorough we should be when we are asking ChatGPT questions or creating a prompt for it to respond to. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So um, let me show you hold on let me show you for an example the difference um let me pull this up again on a different screen here so i'm just gonna have a different screen so if i were for an example um only using my first part right so chat gpt it really takes into consideration everything that you are asking and um and that's why i mentioned too i i do have a, another another session about chat GPT and like really the intricacies of like, you know, how, how careful you have to be. And so if you're interested in learning more about that, um, I'd be happy to go over that too. But just for, for the purpose of this, I, I just want to kind of iterate then that, yeah, we have to be extremely careful with the prompts that we are producing. We have to be, make sure that we have everything in here um, that we are actually covering. Because if I were to take this same prompt and then type it into ChatGPT, but only the part, part, the first section, which is essentially, you know, for some people, this could be enough. Um, it's going to give you a very, different look and feel, okay? Um, so, okay, so we've, I've done the first person or first section and then I could just do this. So basically, okay, um, make, give me this, this session. But now it's really just going over the introduction. It's making up its own learning objectives at this point um, because I haven't included those. And then it's basically just giving me like a whole lecture, right? So this is going to look a lot different than it will when I give it the specificities or specificities of, of this particular prompt, right? So I'm including a lot of detail in here and I'm doing this because this is what you need, especially to be effective, like in your own, uh, uh, in your own activity. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, no, absolutely. I wonder, could you scroll up again? I think there's so much value yeah. in us just having a moment to absorb if we can, the different elements yeah. of your prompt, such as yeah. and, I noticed right, right prompt, away. I will give voice. this. Yeah, I will give this to everyone so that you have exactly you can utilize this and just change it based on your own um, areas. Right. So, 
you can you I will give this to everyone and then you can change it to to like what you are teaching and what materials you're using. But sorry, go awesome. ahead. Keep, keep I, I, I wonder again, for the benefit of the audience and understanding mm -hmm. how to prompt ChatGPT, the fact that you are role playing with ChatGPT I think yes. is, is worth mentioning because it says, pretend that you are a sociology, mm -hmm. like you are assigning a role to ChatGPT to imagine mm -hmm. itself as a professor and then to communicate within that identity. That alone yes. is very fascinating and I think worth um, emphasizing to our audience the way that ChatGPT can function and actually kind of emulate as if it were a professional in a particular field. Yeah, yeah. So that's where um, where, like, where prompting comes in. Um, and I have another document too where um, and I, can, I can give that to everyone too, but it's basically the... Um, Give me one moment. I will just show this to everyone. That way I kind of go over it. Um, okay, so this is another Google Docs that I have, um, which I would be, again, happy to share. But this is talking about, um, sorry, let me see where it's at. Um, actual prompt engineering okay so this is so we have a i usually usually use the light utilize the method that's called create and this is um credited i i i um i participated in a conference over the summer and found this and so we've changed it a little bit but so the create method is basically the character request examples adjustment type and extra so this is how you want to set up your create method prompt. And so I can include this too, if you wanna see basically what this um, what this entails. But so when you're creating prompting with ChatGPT, you wanna talk about your role. You wanna talk about your request. So you wanna be very specific. You wanna provide examples. <clears throat> so if you wanted to um, emulate like your type of work style, you could provide a, stamp, a sample of how you write so that it that it emulates your your um, style of writing, um, <clears throat> and then any adjustments. So um, basically, if you want to have an outline or if you find something that you want to change, you can type this into. Um, explicitly state what it is that you want. So that is what we were doing in in here, right? So I was helping, uh, this is my, my ask, right? So please create a lesson plan for adult learners in an introduction to sociology course. Use these learning objectives to create a lesson plan for a 75 minute session that will pr be presented in person. So we need to make sure that we are very specific here. Okay, and then I'm talking about the components that I want and then how this is going to be tailored. So the learners should be able to demonstrate their understanding through various levels of the Bloom's taxonomy framework by the end of this lesson. So the prompting when you are starting off, this is going to be like your key right here. You need to make sure that your original prompt is very specific or you're not going Going to be able to get good output. So basically, the input that you provide with ChatGPT is is that's you know the the that's that's the cream of the crop right there. That's everything. You need to have good input to get great output. Okay. So like, um, does that, that does that make sense? Thank you. Uh, is there a way you can share the documents uh, with your permission? Uh, are you prompts? Um, yes, I will. Yes, no, I will. I will. Um, I sent it to um Jarek and then also if you if you will be getting access to my presentation you will have links to the prompts at the end of my canvas presentation so everything will be accessible to you mm -hmm. um and if not I, I will give you links at the end of the chat I can type that out too does that work thank you okay hopefully I've answered um answered everyone's questions okay let me get back here um okay I'm trying to see which one I'm working with. Okay, so this one right here, okay. Okay, so now that we have created our original kind of plan, we can see here, it gives me um, the class interaction component. It gives me a summary and evaluation and then some follow-up reading and assignments. So it's kind of talking about like what else we could read. And then um, next, what I want to do is I want to also um, ask ChatGPT to help me with uh, creating the actual <clears throat> lecture component. So again, I'm going to send this and then I am going to talk about it. So 
uh, in the lecture component, then I'm saying, thank you, please help me with the lecture component for this class. Based on the information above, create a presentation that I can use in the PowerPoint to help guide my lecture. The presentation should begin by summarizing the key learning objectives for the chapter, define and explain all relevant components, concepts, and key terms. So again, I'm being incredibly specific, right? So include examples, current events, and relatable information. Also include relevant videos and gamification resources. Only include the lecture component. Do not include instructions for any assignments, quizzes, or class activities. And I'm saying this because I'm going to do this later on. So now it's going to help me actually create, um, let me go down here, actually create my slides. Um, so the, the, the basic information that will be a part of my slides, okay? And then next I could ask for ChatGPT to explain each slide in more detail. So now we're actually getting a little bit more detail than what we previously had. And so, you know, you can include additional things. And so when, when you're reading through these, what's interesting is like with ChatGPT, it learns everything that you're talking about and it remembers the entire conversation, right? So let's say that you read through slide one and there's a couple of things that you don't like or that you feel like you don't wanna talk about. You can let ChatGPT know, can we change slide one around because I don't wanna include this information, but I would like to talk about this information. And then it will help you regenerate that slide. So it's a continuous conversation and you can always um, request for adjustments when you're going through. And if for an example, you don't like this at all, you can also go ahead and click regenerate and then you will have an additional area of your slides. So you could click on the different ones and see if there's one that you like better than the other one. And you can do this for any of the information. So like when you were you know, up here and you were working with your lecture or um, with your lesson plan, you could have changed this as well and gotten a few different responses. So you had some different responses to work with, okay? And then next, um, I want to include a worksheet since this is an in-person class, right? I want to create a worksheet that students can use for this, uh, for the class interaction component. So it came up with an, a class interaction component. So let's go ahead and now actually create a worksheet. And so this is what I really enjoy with ChatGPT because now, you know, yes, it's helped me create my, my, um, my lesson plan, right? But now I can, if I wanted to take this information and then um, go into, uh, sorry, my, my canvas right here. And then I can create a page and then um, worksheet last activity. And I can go ahead and, and edit this, putting all the information in here and it's already formatted pretty nicely and then go ahead and save it. Um, obviously before I do anything, I. I always go through everything. I read through it, make sure that everything makes sense, that the grammar and everything makes sense to, to how I want to talk to my students or my learners. So there is going to be a little bit of tweaking. You can't ever just take something and put it in. You're usually going to have to change a few things around. So before you you put it in, have that conversation with ChatGPT to make sure that it is exactly what you want it to be. And then you can save these little prompts too to help you engage with your students as you are describing your worksheet. So if you wanted to go ahead and save these um, within your lesson plan notes, you can do that as well. Laura, okay. thank you. Sorry for in mm -hmm. the interruption. As no, you, it's okay. As, as, as you're using the uh, prompts, what are mm -hmm. the best practices? Because I know you just copy and paste into your, right into your, uh, into your Canvas, right? What are the mm -hmm. best practices? Like you mentioned something before you paste anything, you read the document, right? Yes. For a question for you, what are the best practices in doing that? Yeah, so um, I would always say that, you know, 
so chat GPT can come up with untrue information. Um, and so anything that you create using chat GPT, you always want to make sure that you read through it. You are going to be um, your, your SME, right? Your, your um, subject matter expert, and you're going to know the information that you want to talk about. So this is a tool to help you with that, but not a replacement. So I would always say that you can take these pieces and then work and build on top of them. So anything that I've ever created within ChatGPT is a great starting point for me to utilize when I'm first getting, you know, th thrown into something. Or if I am building a presentation on like an entirely new lecture, or I find that maybe one of my lesson plans hasn't been very effective. Let's say I did it with three classes and I didn't get, get the results that I wanted. So then now I am rethinking how I did that lesson. So then I go in, have these conversations with ChatGPT, and then for that, um, I I will go through and then tailor everything kind of the way that I want it. So um, these prompts are just something that I've come up with. This isn't something that you know I've taken from anywhere. I have had you know a lot of conversations with ChatGPT to help me kind of uh, get my prompts the way that I want them when I'm using them. So it's it's always about tweaking your own prompts, like your input, right? What you're providing ChatGPT, but then also uh, making sure that you're looking at the output and seeing what it's providing you, and then making tweaks to everything because it's not always accurate also um uh, um uh, sorry i was getting distracted by the chat here <laughs> and then also when we are doing this um we we also want to make sure that like there's no biases because there's been biases within chat gpt like especially because it's taking the information that's based on on the internet right so um you can see sometimes how it has biases in how it's talking about men and women in certain roles. And um, it has biases in, in, in those types of regards. And it's because it's pulling the, the information from the internet. So you always want to verify those pieces too. Well, okay, can you also then, add, I'm sorry, is this, no. is this, the prompts is really, um, it's, you're making a good point right here. I, I do mm -hmm. apologize. Um, no, it's fine. You mentioned we're the expert content of, you know, of our uh, of, uh, disciplines, but mm -hmm. um, I could easily say, you know, uh, please write a uh, one page paper regarding Jadik Janyu. He's a math scientist in chemistry and chat GPT will do that. Mm -hmm. Even though, you know, Dr. Janyu is not a math scientist in chemistry, <laughs> but it would do it, right? So how do you distinguish, you know, what I'm going to ask ChatGPT and then download it into my canvas? Um, so I I think that again, you as the, the subject matter expert, you have to really know the pieces that you're asking for, right? That's why when you're prompting, you have to be very specific. You have to make sure that you're including these pieces. But when it comes to like writing papers and and really anything, um, which is something that I'm going to talk about too when we're when I'm asking you to generate a quiz for um, for this lesson plan, we have to make sure too that we're not asking like because ChatGPT likes to fabricate things and sometimes it comes up with ideas, especially when it's writing papers, it comes up with these ideas that are just like completely bogus like they're not true in any sense but it sounds true it just chat gpt is just excellent at making these these un, untrue and false statements sometimes and that's why it's so important for us to go through and actually evaluate the things that are being written but it would still take us a lot less time if we're recreating a lesson plan from the beginning, including assignments and quizzes and discussion prompts, it is a lot less time consuming for us to prompt, read through and make sure that the information is accurate versus writing it from scratch with no help from the beginning. 
So this is where I find value in it. Um, but then there's also ways where you can ask ChatGPT that when you are writing these things, do not fabricate information, okay? So you can make sure that it's not coming up with fabricated information. And that is something that I do, especially within my quizzes. I make sure that I include within my quiz prompt, do not fabricate any information, make sure that all questions and answers are true. Okay, so does that answer your question? Uh, yes, yes. Uh, I think Danny. You, you, yeah. Thank you, Enrique. Yeah, uh, Zola, I again, yes. thank you for everything you've, you've offered so far. It really sounds to me like you are surfacing an emerging best practice as an educator in terms of the quality of the prompts and the quality of the ask that you have of ChatGPT. A question for all of us is, do you have specific recommendations for us as educators in terms of that being a best practice of how we should maybe store or keep track or further develop the prompts that we may have um, as we teach our courses semester after semester to keep things fresh and to keep track of the way in which we use ChatGPT to create products. Yeah, so ChatGPT, it does um, save all of your conversations in your sidebar. I don't have that open because I don't want to see, I don't want to have you see all of my crazy conversations right now, but it does save everything. But then I also like to, you know, when I am done with something, I do um, have Google Docs that I will then name as my lesson plans. And so everything that I am creating, I'll save it in my Google Docs. And then if I had something in particular within ChatGPT that I'm using or that I really liked or that I didn't like at all because sometimes I've done prompts and I'm like, oh no, I don't like this answer at all. Like this is not anything that I asked for. Then I might save that so that I know what not to return to. But I do like to save, you know, all my, my courses, my lesson plans, making sure that everything that I've created, I kind of can backtrack and look at it a little bit. Um, but in general, I think when you are start. Uh, when you're starting off, it's just a lot of playing around with it, learning how it responds mm. to certain things and really recognizing too that it's just an assistant. It's not there to replace you. It's not there to fill in your expertise. You have to still be the person who are bridging those gaps between the AI tool and what you're creating, right? So I, I, um, I think that just in general, saving your conversations, saving what you've done with ChatGPT uh, is a great way to return. And like I said too, like these are some of the prompts that I go back to over and over because I've used them and I've kind of found that, that some of them, you know, they're tried and true, but that doesn't mean that every output that I get is appropriate to what I'm asking. Um, so even though, you know, I'm using this, um, sometimes when I'm creating certain lesson plans or when I'm changing an assignment, I might have to regenerate that assignment or change my ask a little bit, like five times before I actually get what I wanted to do. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. So, so Google Docs you're recommending is a useful tool for us yes. as educators to keep track of the lesson building and the, the, the prompting that we give to chat GPT. Yes. And yes, again, um, I will, well, let me see. Let me make sure that I have, um, here, yeah, copy. Okay. I will send you the lesson prompt link right now in the chat, just so you have it, but it should also be on the website, um, for coaches, for the coaches website. Everything should be uploaded there eventually as well. And then, so you can feel free to copy this and, you know, um, use it as your own, right? Absolutely. Okay, so um, the next portion that I wanna go through, so now we've created a worksheet. And so we have, um, you know, pieces that we can use if we wanted to change anything, this would be a good time to do that. And obviously, um, sorry, when we are putting that into our worksheet and class activity as well. Um, someone was asking, I saw a little bit further up, let me answer that too, for the slides, how I do my slides. And so um, it depends. Some slides I will maybe just, I'll, I'll start with creating the lesson plan, seeing like what structure that, um, that ChatGPT is recommending. And sometimes I'll 
pick up my textbook and then I will specifically look at like things that I wanted to talk about. And so I'll manually write out like within these slide presentations, these are the, the key components that I want you to focus on. And then it will kind of manually write out that. And then at the end, um, because ChatGPT as of yet doesn't actually do pictures and images, I do know that the default here is going to change to 4.0 soon. And I believe that with that, it will have a picture component um, embedded into it too. I'm not sure how that's going to look like yet because it's not been provided, but I know that they've been working on it. But um, you can, what you can do, if anything, is ask uh, ChatGPT to recommend images and videos to use. So you can say, can you please recommend images and videos to use within my lecture components? And then um, it won't give you like a link to an image and it won't give you an image, but it will give you recommendations of like, okay, well, why don't we look at um, how income looks in the United States versus income in a different country, for an example. So compare and contrast images. And so it, it might recommend like these are the type of images that would be appropriate for this specific learning objective or for this particular slide. And then I'll go and search for those. Okay. And then incorporate that. Hopefully that, that makes sense. Um, okay. And then next. So um I have my worksheet and now I also want to create a discussion. So please also create a discussion for this lesson that learners would complete on their own. They will complete this discussion online on Canvas LMS. Actually, let me go ahead and generate it. Um, the learner, uh, the learner should submit their original post no later than Thursday at 11.59 p.m. So this is just, again, how I structure my class, right? You can change this based on how you structure yours if you even have the discussion component in there. They should also submit two responses by Sunday at 11.59 p.m. The original post must be at least 350 words, include APA citations, and the responses be no less than 150 words. Each post must be thoughtful, add insight, and be considerate. So again, it's you know very thorough with how I want my students to actually submit their posts. And sometimes I will have additional components with my posts where maybe they have to watch a video first or they have to respond to an article. Um, um, and then I will include that in my prompt as well. And so this is then what it creates. Um, if you like the format of this, you can keep it that way. If you don't, again, you can change um, your format. And so then you can see how, how it formats. Um, for me, I have a format that I like. Um, and so sometimes what I will do is I will also copy the format that I'm using. So I will basically send this and then I will say, please use the following format from a prior discussion. And then I will just quote it, paste my format and how my, my um, prior discussion might have been and then send it. And then it will actually format my discussion the way that my other discussions have been formatted already. So it's nice to know that it can do that as well. Um, okay. And after that, um, while we're still on the, the lesson planning here, my final thing might be to create an assignment that students will need to complete on their own as homework. The assignment should help students explore the above topics. Here, you probably want to be more specific, right? You want to have a specific learning outcome. And the assignment should be relevant to the learners. Um, please make sure that assignment is both culturally relevant, because that's important in my courses, and that it is tailored towards multiple learning style styles. Please also develop a grading criteria where the point total of the assignment is 50 points. Okay. So then it will go through and do that. And um, again, you know, if you like it, you can keep it. If you don't, you can regenerate and it'll give you various types of different um, assignments. Um, and then now I'm going to kind of switch over. So now we have our assignment. Um, and once we've done that, we are going to talk a little bit about rubrics. Okay. So once we have our assignment, so for me, um, 
I use Canvas in such a way where basically within a assignment, um, let me just show you here. Um, I, let me see, hopefully I have them in my, in my module here. Yeah, so within my assignments, I also utilize the actual rubrics. And um, some of them I'll have it set to where, you know, it is um, like a set. And sometimes you can also change it where it has a range. So depending on what type of assignment I'm doing, I will, I will change this up. Um, for this purpose, I have created a prompt that is um, basically going to, again, take the grading criteria above and then create a rubric. The rubric should include use of APA citations for external sources. The rubric should use three grading skills. And so this is usually with, within my newer grading skills. These are the three that I've been using. So accomplished, competent, and then developing or missing. And then please also provide a description for each criteria that explains each sections in, in depth. So let's look at how then that would look like. Uh, okay, let me see. Let's see if it will do it in a table. So this is typically how I prefer that it looks like. And then that way, now um, I have a table. And so if there's anything that I want to change up, I can go through and read these. Again, always make sure that you as the educator are reading through your rubrics, right? And that you um, know that they make sense for your assignment. Um, and you want to create the rubric once you have um, an assi the assignment the way that you want it. And sometimes I also want to um, kind of let you know here, for an example, if you create an assignment and then you put it into, um, you put it into Canvas, um, and then let's say that you take this assignment. So let's go through the, the whole thing like this. Oh, wait, sorry. Okay, here. So if you take this assignment, and then you read through it. So this is typically what I do, like I'll take it. And then once I'm at this point, I'll read through it. And then I make changes and I make tweaks. Um, and this might be like the grading criteria. I might change this up a little bit. Anything that I change. Now, once I've done all my edits, I will take my assignment again. And then I will post it over to ChatGPT. And I will say, this is my edited assignment. And then again, I will post it. And then after this, I will ask it to create my rubric. So depending on how you're doing it, you know, if you find something that, oh, you just, you love it the way that it is, you can use it right away. But if you make changes, then I take it back into ChatGPT and I let ChatGPT know I've made edits. Can you make a rubric based on my edits? Okay. Um, and then at this point, now that I have this beautiful table set up, I will go through and basically um, copy and paste this into my actual rubric. So let's say I liked this. Oh yeah, sorry, I need a name here. And let's say I really like this. So now I have my rubric and so I will start creating a rubric, okay? The first time you do this, it's a little bit more of a setup, but if you're using um, kind of the same three or five, depending on how you do your own rubrics, you might be able to just copy and paste a prior rubric. Otherwise, it's really the first time that, you know, you have to get all of the different boxes set up. So I will go ahead and basically um, put, put this into canvas like this. Um, so survey report and analysis, okay. Uh, 
so that when you um, do have a minute, uh, I, yeah. Kevin Kevin has a good uh, quick question. Kevin, would you like to speak to your uh, comment? Uh, if I understand the comment that you're talking about, sorry, I, I, I vomited a lot of things in the chat today. Uh, so I'm starting to think through the, uh, the balance between using these tools to help us versus the what do we get out of doing it ourselves, including the application of unconscious competence and all the judgment that goes into that. So I, I'm just wrestling with the how much of this is really appropriate to be asking someone or something else to be doing versus how much of this is really the responsibility of a highly qualified experienced instructor, uh, structural mm -hmm. designer, somebody like that. I'm just I'm, I'm just really wrestling with a lot of these ideas in my head about uh, where do we draw the line, what is appropriate to be asking for help, what kinds of help um, in there, and at what cost um, and, uh, when we're asking for help. How is this kind of... How are these tools going to be shaping our thinking what's available because i'm mm -hmm. thinking back to things like um there were some really there's been some cool work about the influence of powerpoint on uh, military communication because of the massive reliance of the united states military on this particular tool and how it's actually shaped the way information is communicated in the u.s military so that sounds like a really weird example but i'm kind of thinking through the implications of using these tools and how it's going to affect us in the long term yeah. And obviously, I mean, I think these are questions for like how in general you want to proceed, but I just think it's important to always remember that, you know, ChatGPT is not the teacher. It's not the educator. It's your tool to help your help you in your job. So while this isn't something that I do for all my lessons, it is something that I do for pieces of my lessons. Or if I, like I said, if I am regenerating a new lesson and I need help with some ideas, it's easier for me to go through all of these prompts and have the whole lesson plan basically built up because then I can get ideas and you know I can generate multiple different ideas and then I can pick and choose and then I can tweak and change and edit based on these ideas and so there's never anything that I just take straight from here it still requires me as you know as the instructor me as the professional to go in read through everything evaluate critically analyze and then again you know I find these examples, these videos, these images, everything else that needs to go in to kind of go hand in hand with my lessons. So it's never just about using these tools the way that they are. They're just supposed to be, you know, an, an extension of the work that you're already doing to help you make things go faster. And that's why, you know, when I'm creating things, I already know exactly how I want. So this is the this original prompt is usually what takes me the longest to sit down and look at. So, you know, I, I think about, okay, what is it that I'm actually wanting to use in this course? What are the learning objectives? So obviously we as educators in our classes, we already have our learning, like, like our student learning outcomes, right? And then our course outcomes, so we can utilize that. But then is there anything else that I want my students to really look at? Um, what are things that I want them to know? What are some articles that I have come across that I want to implement. And so all these things, I have to sit down, write them out first, think about it, and then I use that to create my original prompt. So it's always going to be about, you know, the quality of the input of you. And if you weren't there to provide these, ChatGPT would never spit them out either, right? Like it, everything that it's creating is based on um, your professionalism, your knowledge, everything that you know that you need help with, um, you know, within your class. I hope I hope that answers your question a little bit, but I think it's just the biggest thing here is just to recognize that this isn't not this is not meant to replace what you're already doing it's really just to help you you know with specific tools like for an example even if i only need help with a discussion within a certain um within a certain uh, lesson i still go through the entire prompt because i want that discussion to be tailored 
onto my the rest of my entire class right mm -hmm. so I still write everything out but then I might only use that discussion piece because that's all I need but it's helping me make sure that it's well-rounded that I'm covering the learning objectives and it's doing everything that um you know I might not have thought about and then maybe I had a discussion in mind and I could even write that in can you help me you know edit this or can you look at my discussion and make sure that it's actually fulfilling my student learning outcomes these are things things that I'll use it for too. So it's really just as a as another tool to help you, but without your analyzing abilities and critical thinking abilities, you're never going to get quality output. You're never going to get anything that you're actually going to be able to teach your students the way that you just have it. Um, hopefully, yes, Danny. Uh, yeah, Zola, as, you're, as, as you've been speaking, I've been kind of imagining mm -hmm. the, the evolving identity of the instructor, of, of us mm -hmm. as educators, as instructors, to the point where you're kind of opening up a world where the instructor becomes an editor, becomes almost like a producer or a director, where in mm -hmm. the old tradition, instructors are the writer and the actor. <laughs> yeah. And what I'm seeing yeah. here with the chat GPT tool is it's actually allowing us to perhaps evolve our practices where of course we can still do those traditional roles, but we now have access to these technology tools that allow us to have perhaps a different mindset or even a more expanded mindset um, mm -hmm. to allow us to increase the quality of our courses, especially those of us who have open education resource courses and instructors are really trying to figure out ways to develop their own material to really help mm -hmm. students achieve the student learning outcomes for the course. I wonder if you could speak to that evolving role of the instructor vis-a-vis uh, -vis ChatGPT product creation. Yes, but I'm realizing we're running out of time here. So I do um I I I do have another prompt here with how to actually do quizzes. And so I don't know if we want to go through that or if I should if I should just keep talking. Um because well, this normally, is yeah, we normally end at, at 12. So you know if you if if you think you can wrap it up in about five to seven minutes, I think we can do it. If you yeah, I'll, it's it's your okay. Time. I'm gonna go through this quickly then, um, just so that you can see it, because this is also super cool. And this is like one of the things that I'm you know, most excited about showing you all. But this is a way um, to use ChatGPT to create quizzes for you. So um, since we have limited time and since you now have access to the documents, go through and read this table. But again, I want you to um, make sure that you see here. So all questions and answers must be accurate and not fabricated. OK, so that's one of those things that we talked about, right? Making sure that you have this in here. Um, and then basically you have your so I have my ask. So create a random 15 question multiple choice and true and false quiz to cover the contents of this lesson. Okay, and then I'm talking about columns. And the way that I am structuring this is so that we can use it to implement it into um, our Canvas LMS without having to copy paste the way that you saw me do the rubric. So let's see how this looks like. I'm gonna show you here. So again, for the purpose of this demonstration, I am not going to go over all of these questions to see if they're actually true or not, but that is absolutely something that I would do otherwise. So what we wanna do now is once we have this, we're going to take every single one of these and we are going to copy that. So I just pushed control C to copy. And then I am going to open up, can you see my desktop here? Just yes, my regular? we can. Okay, perfect. Wow. Um, okay. So I'm going to open this up. Beautiful. No, that's not what I wanted. So I'm sorry. That's not at all what I wanted. I wanted Excel. Uh, there we go. Okay. And then I'm going to oh, paste this and we are going to paste it without any formatting in it. Okay. So now this is our table. And um, I'm going to go ahead and delete this first one. And then now that we have everything in our table, this is a place where we, if we needed to, we would then go through and actually read, make sure that everything is correct. But again, I'm not doing that right now. And then I'm going to save this. And so the important thing here is that you want to save this as a CVS uh, or CSV, sorry. So a C CSV file because that is what we are going to use next. 
Um, actually, let me make sure that I am saving this in a place where I can actually find it right away. Um, and then I'm going to just call it social quiz. And then I'm just going to do, um, let me just make sure it's like on my desktop here. Okay, perfect. Um, then I'm going to open up another tool, which I will also give you all um, one moment here. Okay, so this tool right here converts our files into a QTI file. And this is what Canvas um, reads. So I'm gonna, again, I'm gonna take this and pop that into my downloads. Okay, and then I am going to um, open up this again. So now that I'm in my course, I'm gonna go down to settings and I'm going to import course content. And I am going to select the QTI file and I'm going to choose um, this file that I just downloaded. We don't wanna unzip it. We just leave it the way that it is. And then we import it. Okay, so now that we have this, this should have been implemented in here. Um, sorry, not assignments, but courses. Okay, and now here it is. And we can preview it and look at all the questions. Make sure that everything functions the way that they are supposed to function, make any edits that we want to do. Um, let's go back to edit and the questions. And so from here, um, we might also want to provide some feedback that we want to implement. So then I can ask ChatGPT to provide feedback and it will make everything in a beautiful table again. That way I can see exactly what it is that I want to implement. Okay. So now if I wanted to produce some, um, some true and false, you know, into my questions here. So for or some feedback into my questions here, I can just go ahead and do that. And I can utilize this again, I would also, you know, go through this and make sure that all of these are correct. Um, and then I can copy and paste this. And if I didn't like this feedback, I can regenerate it again to make something different. Or if I want to specify how I wanted to talk to my students, I can do that as well. Um, but that way, now I've, I've basically gotten this this quiz set up. Um, and then the final thing that I would do is um, then ask it to create a two paragraph overview of the quiz as an introduction. And here I would also, yeah, I'll send, I'll send everybody the converter in a moment too. Here I would also um, suggest like images um, for the introduction. And then if I wanted like a specific due date in here, those are also things that I would pr prefer. Um, okay, so here it's giving me two examples, an introduction, and then, you know, it's talking about the images, and then here's just the, uh, a different introduction. So let's say that I click that one, and then I can take that information and um, edit it into my quiz, so into the details, and then go ahead and save it. And then now I have a, a quiz that we, you know, instead of spending a few hours on a quiz that we normally would, we have created something in, in a lot less time. Again, I wouldn't take this information and just put it up there. I would go through everything, make sure that everything is, it it, it is the way that I want it to be. Um, but, and I would have demonstrated that before the purpose of this, we don't really have the time right now. So I hope that this was, um, useful for everyone and if you have any questions i guess we have a couple of minutes here this this has been fantastic zola i think uh we'll, we'll just book your time for every friday from now on until <laughs> <laughs> there's just so much information there i tell you the the chat is just exploding with thank you notes and, and, and the valuable information it's been it's been really spot on 
Um, that's right. There's just 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 a lot of really, really very positive supporting comments. So what can I say? Thank you so much. Zola, we'll probably ask you to, to stop by again, you know, maybe not every Friday, but sometime in the <laughs> Uh, and, yeah, and, and, and I'm so sorry I didn't get to even read through all the comments. Right. I will I'll see if I can take a few minutes to do that. But um if you want to reach out to me, um I'm gonna post my email in the chat here too. So please feel free to re reach out to me. Uh it's instructor Zola Ponte. Oh, sorry, at gmail.com, not with a slash. Right on, thank you. And the the chat, the recording, the PowerPoint, all the resources are going to be posted on the on the coach's blog again. So there is going to be Zola's information as well. So please don't hesitate. You can reach out to her, reach out to us. Um, anyway, um, you 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 see fit to 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 get this information and and learn from it. Thank you so much. Really, really, really appreciate. It. Very, very kind of you to 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 share all this. Yeah, data. and and Jarek, I'll share all the other Google Docs too, since I know a lot of folks were interested in those as well, like the the create prompting and things like that. So I'll make sure that I'll have that sent your way too, so you can upload that as well. It would be fantastic. Thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. We'll see you next week. Thank have you. Thank week, you. Everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. Thank you a lot.